three sides of the coin. I cannot tell you how excited and honored we are to have Blackie Lawless from Wasp joining us today. Blackie, thank you for taking some time out of your, your very busy schedule, getting ready for your upcoming world tour to chat with some Kiss Geeks. Well, thanks for having me. I sure appreciate it. Let me ask, let me ask you this first question. Would you consider yourself a Kiss Geek? I'm not even sure what that is. But, <laughs> you know, um, so it's hard to say yes. <laughs> I mean, are are you are you I mean, the story you you've known Ace going way back. Are you a Kiss fan? It seems obvious to me that you are, but are you a Kiss fan? Are you have you been a fan of what the band has been doing through their whole career? I would say yes, but I would have to put a little asterisk next to it because and I think whether it's me or anybody who has known somebody on a personal level, it's always difficult to see other performers the same way that uh, to give you an example, you know, Elvis you know, I see Elvis in a totally different world because I never met him. When you get sure. to know someone, it becomes different because when you're watching them perform, you, there's a kind of a duality that goes on there. And when you, when you see them performing live, the first thing your brain sees is, oh, that's my buddy, you know, but then they'll do something every once in a while. And then you'll realize, oh, yeah, that's how they got where they are. That was you cool. Know, so it kind of gives you the goosebumps. It, yeah, you, there's a little back and forth that happens between that. And I would, I would say that's probably not just myself. It's probably anybody that you know, knows other people that, that you know, do stuff like this for a living. Well, so let's, let's go all the way back. When did you and Ace first meet? How did you become early friends? They were just getting started, and we met at a party one night. And, you know, I was doing, I was in a band called Black Rabbit at the time, and we were doing face paint and a very, very similar type of show. But we, we didn't know who they were. We had no knowledge of them. You know, and like I said, they were just getting started. And, um, you know, so him and I started talking, and, Quite honestly, it was kind of a meeting of the minds type thing, you know. It's like he'd say something, and I go, "Yeah, that's that's correct," or I'd say something, and you know, he'd be able to identify with it. So, you know, we struck up really a pretty strong kindred friendship from the get go. You know, I mean, it was I don't know. I mean, you, everybody's probably had situations where they've met people, you know, and there was just this magnetic attraction. You know, and, and um, that's pretty much what it was. Were what? you would, would, were you at any of the early first Kiss shows, Kiss rehearsals? Did he invite you out to those events? Well, what happened is the first time I saw them uh, play live, they were opening for Blue Oyster Cult. And the, I think their set was like 30 minutes or something like that. And... Um, so they, like I said, they were just getting started. <clears throat> they had just finished the first record. And, but I do remember being in sessions where, you know, they'd be rehearsing just the three of them without Peter, without drums. And I don't know if people know what pig nose amps are, but there's these little kind of, they're the size of a, of a school book, mm -hmm. you know, and they've got a little speaker in them and stuff and you can use them. They're only five Watts. You know, and you can use them to rehearse with or tune up with, things like that. And they'd be sitting in a room, you know, working on, on material on pig noses. So, you know, that's, that's um, you know, getting to, to be a part of something like that for any band. You know, it's always cool to sit in on it and watch it. Did you, did you that early on recognize something special or unique in what you were seeing? Well, the thing that, that I saw and felt the most, was when you were in a room with them, there was an electricity. And not so much individually, but when they were together, you could cut it with a knife. And there would be a couple of more times later on in my life that I would be around other bands 
and you could feel it the same with, with these other people. But they were the first ones I had ever experienced that with. There was just this thing. It's hard to put your finger on, on what to name it or call it. Would, would you call that the, the magic, which we hear thrown around so often? Like, there was maybe, magic there. But there was a magnetism to the people. You know, and when they would talk about what they were doing, sparks would fly off their ass. You know, I mean, and it wasn't, I remember the first time I met Paul, we were talking about, you know, what he thought the band could achieve. And I remember specifically, and I, I can remember almost word for word what he said, because he, he told me, he says, I'll talk about Black Sabbath. I'll talk about Led Zeppelin. I'll talk about any band you want to talk about, because we're going to be bigger than all of them. Now, when somebody makes a statement like that, especially when the world don't know who they are, it's usually seen as someone, you know, bragging or, you know, just really shooting their mouth off. But that's not what I got off of him. I mean, the look that was on his face when he was talking, you know, it's like the old expression, I ain't conceited, I'm convinced. You know, and it, that's really what it was with him. You know, just he was absolutely possessed, you know, and what he thought they were capable of doing. And you have to have that kind of commitment level, don't you, on, in when you enter into a band like that? Yeah, you got to believe in yourself, you know. Um, but like I said, I've been around other people before, you know, and there's usually an arrogance that comes with something like that. But this was not an arrogance that came off of him. This was a conviction. It's a big difference. Yeah. Were, were, you, were you able to notice, like, amongst each, each guy, was there a, we're in this together, we've got everybody's back? In the beginning, we, yes. Yeah, you it know, because obviously was, we... Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, it was a four musketeers type scenario. They, they were a tight little unit. And, and and when was, I say tight, I don't mean just musically. I'm talking about personnel wise. Was was there an indication back then that it was being led by Gene and Paul, or was that not even visible? Yeah, because at that point? in the beginning, when they first went on the road, you know, they didn't have any money, you know, so they whatever hotels they were in, Gene and Paul room together, and Peter and Ace room, and the others together. So you start you started to see. I mean, in the beginning, I didn't think about it, you know, but um, yeah. you started to see that there was, as time would go by, you could see that separation happening. Now, let's let's kind of fast forward a bit. You end up moving out to California. When did that happen? And And I remember you telling me a story about one of the first jobs you had which is KISS related, interestingly enough, when you moved out to California? Well, I moved out in the summer of 75 in July. The job that I ended up happening wouldn't happen for actually a couple more years. It was, I think that job was summer of 78 that I got. But there was a guy named Ron Boutwell, and he was, he made a lot of different posters for a lot of different artists at that time. And this place that I worked at was a printing company or a printing house. And we actually made the, the actual posters. You know, we did the artwork, we did the printing and all that. And as the band started to grow in popularity, uh, which would have been actually sometime before that, but when I started working there, I had no idea that they were doing those posters. And so that was something that w was strange because... <laughs> you know, in, a, in kind of a, an unusual way, you might say. Um, I remember doing, there would we would do group posters on them. And then we would do individual posters on them. And the thing that I found strange, because for me, you know, I met, I actually met Gene before I met Ace. And so okay. there was, there was a connection, you know, I could see, you know, I would, and I'll be quite candid here. I mean, Gene was the guy that I identified with, you know, from his personality perspective and, you know, his stage persona and all that, uh, you know, I thought, okay, that's the guy, you know, that if I was going to do something like this, you know, he'd be the guy 
that I'd grav- gravitate towards, but my true friendship was Ace. And so what I found strange about the posters, because I'm identifying with Gene as a person and a character, was the number of the run that we would do every time we would do those posters. Because when we would do the individual posters, we would do a run of 10,000 each of Gene, 10,000 of Peter, and 10,000 of Paul. But when we did Ace's run, it would be 20,000. And that wasn't just once or twice. And I, so I made some inquiries to the people that were, were taking the orders for Boutwell. And I said, why is this? And they said, well, obviously he's the one selling the most. And I said, well, why do you think that is? And, and you got to remember, this was at a time when Star Wars was popular or just becoming popular. And kids, and when I say kids, I mean, you know, 10-year-olds were starting to identify with the whole spaceman thing. Yeah. And so the next time they were in town, you know, I went over to see him and I shared that with him and it was information I don't think he was privileged to. And I remember (laughs) the look on his face when I said it and there was this kind of a quizzical look on his face. You know, I could see him putting pieces of the puzzle together and he, you know, he sit there for a second and he goes, I knew it, you know, (laughs) so. You know, it's, um, you and, know, and those things, those are the kind of things that when you're on the inside of something, unless you're getting direct reports. And in those days, that would have been impossible to get direct reports unless you had somebody on the inside, which I was, and just miraculously happened to be on the inside. I mean, what's the chances of that happening? Yeah. But, you know, I was in the right place at the right time and, uh. You know, got to see and, 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 those and you, numbers for myself. And it you got know, my attention. I'll, I'll say that because I, I would have bet money it would have been Gene. Well, you yeah. know, you know that after you told Ace that he probably called Gene and. Oh, I'm sure he did. <laughs> I'm sure he did. Oh, well, you know, not asking for more money, probably, but certainly to remind them. Remind them who's to... the most popular. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, that's, that's funny. Love it. Um. So let's let's. It reminds me of a story that would happen years later. We would be, we did not our first tour with them, but the second one, we were going, we were going pretty good guns at that point. I mean, we were, we were steamrolling and Gene got upset one day about something uh, was happening with the merch. And so I think we were, I, I think we were in Sacramento and I was aggravated about something that was happening with Soundcheck, so I call him up. I says, "You got to come down here." And so he came down, and so we talked about the Soundcheck situation for a while. Got that sorted out, and he goes, "While I'm here, I want to talk to you about this merch." And I go, well, "What's the problem?" He goes, "Where your merch booths are getting set up." I said, well, "What's that got to do with me?" He goes, "Come here, I'll show you." So we walked out in front of the arena. And I could see where the merch booths were being set up, and ours were were literally next door to theirs. And the problem that he was having is we were out merching them two to one at that point, and that's not that's not you know a speculation. That's a fact. If they did twenty five grand, we were doing fifty grand a night. And he he looks up and he says, "I come out to these merch booths and I see a poster of Gene, I see a poster of Paul, I see a poster of Blackie. I'm not in the band with Blackie." I don't want to be in a band with black. <laughs> you know, and I looked at him. And I says, you do now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fun. Uh, that, that, that is Gene. I mean, I, I, I won't get in. We can talk about it at another time, but I've got stories like that when I was working with. That's, that's a typical too. Gene. That's, that's typical just, Gene. That is such a Gene. That's just Gene. But you know what? A lot of people. I don't know what the word is. I'm not going to say bad mouth, but, you know, want to cast dispersions, let's say, on him and his personality. I've never met a guy with a better work ethic. Oh, without question. He cares. He cares about his, his, his band and his business. I'll give you an example, you know, and I'm probably being a little prejudiced here, but, you know, I would, when they first started and they were, they were on their first tour, you know, I would call Ace about once a month, you know, just check in with him, see where he was, how the band was going. And th- it was rough for them then. I mean, I remember calling him at one point 
before they did the the first live record and telling him, you know, or him telling me rather, you know, he said, I think it's over. And I said, what do you mean? He says, we're waiting for a call to tell us to come home any day. You know, he says, we're out of money. The label's out of money. You know, so I, like I said, I would talk to him about once a month. And I, one time I called up and Gene got on the phone and so because Ace was out of the room. And so we talked for a minute and then Gene knew the band that I was in. And he said to me, because he says, how's it going? I says, I don't know. I'm pretty demoralized. I said, I'm thinking about giving it up. He goes, don't do that. Whatever you do, don't quit. I said, what do you mean? He goes, those guys you, you're playing with, he goes, they're all losers. He goes, you need to go get in a band with guys like you. He goes, but whatever you do, do not quit. You have that thing, whatever it is, you have it. He goes, don't quit. And he kept hammering me on it. And I got off the phone with him. And that was the pep talk I needed at that precise moment in my life. Because I was really considering walking away. Now, whether I would have walked away permanently, probably not. But that was, that picked me up that I desperately needed. And I cannot emphasize how low I was at that moment. And his words were ringing out in my ears. So, like I said, you know, maybe there's some bias on my part, but I look at him and I see someone that uh, I admire. I agree. Yeah, I completely that's, agree. That's, yeah, what a great story. So, so go ahead, Tom. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, um, I because I, we only have a half an hour, I'd love to talk a little bit about Wasp before we get to the reunion or the 40th anniversary tour, excuse me. Um, tell me a little bit about that. I, I know that we have a lot of hardcore Wasp fans, and of all of the bands that are 80s bands, the one band that I think has a really hardcore following is your band. And you're one of the few that I don't see out on the road and haven't for many years. And I do a lot of photography and I do a lot of festivals. And I know that seeing Wasp would be something that would make so many people happy. What was it that got you to go, you know, it's 40 years on. Well, whether it's us, whether it's us or any band, I, I think it's the same. You know, if a promoter is willing to to bring you somewhere and the offer is worthwhile, you'll do it. You know, with us, it was a question of promoters in the United States, you know, having the confidence to, to put a tour together and, you know, to string a group of dates together that'll make sense for everybody. I mean, we've been, you know, we've never stopped. I mean, we've played the rest of the world. Unfortunately for us, you know, we've been able to to work in the rest of the world and do well. Right. Uh, you know, but America was a different scenario, you know, so it hasn't been until just recently. And I think fans, you know, fans, for better or for worse, want to blame a band for everything. You know, if yeah. they buy a T-shirt that's made in Pakistan and it falls apart, you know, if that they bought from a bootlegger, you know, but it's got the band's name on it. They blame the band because they think the band's in the back of the bus printing the T-shirts, you know, and that's not true, you know. So, or in a situation where they haven't played somewhere for a while, they think the band just doesn't want to go there. That's not true. Most bands that I know, if they're given decent offers, you know, from a reputable promoter, they'll go, you know. So it's not just that people don't want to do something. You know, so that's that's certainly been the case with us. The the, fa- the fan the fans tend to forget there's a business aspect to yeah. music and to and there's a hundred people behind the scenes that are in powerful positions that they never they never know exist. Exactly, exactly. Um, when it comes to Wasp, and we're going to go back a little bit here, and then we'll end with more about the the upcoming tour. Um, when you were putting Wasp together before you got your first record deal, I understand you guys auditioned for Bill Coin and Ace Fraley. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I, it wasn't exactly an audition. It was a it was a show that we did at the Troubadour. We we played, and that's actually upcoming the anniversary, the fortieth anniversary will be, there was two shows that we did at the Troubadour in September of 82. The first one was on the 21st, and the second one was on the 28th. 
Now, having known Ace for, for quite some time, you know, I told him, I said, you know, we're doing these demo tapes, you know, and I'd like to send you and Bill one and see what you think. And so I did, and they both got back to me and said they liked them. And I said, well, you know, we're we're playing, a, you know, a show. Would you like to come out? And so it was actually looking back in hindsight, it was premature. Uh, but they came out on the second show, which was the 28th. And you know, we we talked for a long time after that. We actually made plans to go forward. But the thing that was making me uncomfortable was the situation that Bill had with Billy Idol at the time because Billy Idol's record was just just tearing the charts up. And I was afraid of getting into a situation where I was not going to get the attention that a new band would need to do that. And then it wasn't long after that that I ran into Rod Smallwood, who ended up managing the band. But... Um, you know, I still remain friends with, with Bill. I would see him from time to time at different, you know, business outings and things like that. And we always remain friendly. Can can you talk a little bit about, I think it was eight songs that were recorded slash demoed. Um, did Ace have any involvement with those initial no, he songs? Didn't. No, he didn't. We We did those on our own first, but what was supposed to have happened was that he was going to produce the actual album once we got a deal. But when Bill was no longer involved in the situation, it just kind of slowly fell by the wayside and nothing really ever happened. And, you know, like I said, we ended up signing with Capital. And then they get involved and, you know, it becomes kind of like the hundred people scenario behind the scenes I was just talking about it becomes more complicated. So, so let's, um, let's fast forward. You're, you're going to be kicking off the 40th anniversary tour in the U S uh, end of October, and it's going to go over into Europe next spring. Um, you know, there you you've been talking a lot that this is like back to the beginning. This is the show so many people have never seen. Um, without obviously giving away all of the details, where where are you going with this? What are you hoping to achieve? What what's what what are you what are you working on for this tour? Well, you know, to do a fortieth retrospective. I think you have to be able to give them a sampling of a little bit of each one of those decades. But considering, I would say, half our audience at this point never saw us in the beginning. You know, these shows are the, you know, saw about touring with Kiss. You know, yeah. they weren't there. They didn't see any of that. You know, so to try to, to bring them up to speed, so to speak, you know, we want to really take it back to where it started. In 87, we did a record, or 86 actually, we did a record called Inside the Electric Circus. Mm -hmm. And we had the tour before that, we had, were with Kiss on that. And when we left, you know, one of the last days we were there uh, on that tour, they were doing sound check. And I walked up on the stage, and Gene and I were talking for a minute. And the tour was coming to an end, and he says, So. He goes, it's been good to have you. He says, but I assume next year you'll be headlining, correct? And I just looked at him and nodded my head, yes, you know, because we could see where we were going. So, you know, and he was correct, you know, so we were moving into arenas at that point. And, but the show that I wanted to do was based on an, because it was called Inside the Electric Circus, was based on a 1930s type carnival, like a, a cheap carnival. You know, yeah. more like um, some sort of a, I won't call it a geek show, but a, a very, very dark 1930s carnival. Well, because we were moving into arenas, the argument coming from the agents and the promoters, it needs to be bigger. It needs to be flashier. So slowly over a period of a few weeks, it started evolving to where I thought it should go into this thing that was big and bombastic and flashy. And yeah, it looked great in big rooms, but it really wasn't where I saw it going. So what we're doing now is we're putting this kind of part 1930s carnival 
part road warrior, part voodoo ceremony, if you like, you know, that has all these elements rolled together. And when people see it, they'll understand what the band really was, was going for in the beginning. And I'll be honest with you. I'm, and I know this may sound like hype, but you know, cause all, all artists say this, but, I don't normally say this, but I'm genuinely excited about doing this because I know what this thing is going to look like when it's done. And quite honestly, I can't really wait to get into it. Well, and to me, as a concert goer, I appreciate that type of idea that it's not just going to be the four people standing on stage with some drums and some amps. I, I like the idea of a vaudeville show or like to your point, the electric circus. I saw the show when you toured with Kiss on that tour. It was at Animalize or Asylum. I don't remember which it was, one it, it was. It was the Asylum tour, Tommy. Yeah, in St. and you Paul. had the, okay, and you had those huge heads and stuff on stage. Mm -hmm. That was to me that was fantastic. And so I want to ask you a couple of questions quickly about this because I'm reacting to all of the listeners that we have that talk about you guys all the time. And there's some questions of, that they want to have answers to. So one of them is, is you answered already, you're going to bring back this show. Are you going to pay, play bass? And if so, why? Or why not? Well, I'm a guitar player by trade. Okay. You know, and I played bass in the beginning because with the other guys that were in the band, the other two guitar players, uh, I knew they weren't going to play bass. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so... I okay. was kind of, uh, by default, elected to do it, but I had the chemistry of the people, and to me, that was the most important thing. But when Randy Piper left the band, that gave me an opportunity to go back to play guitar. Right. So that's really where my natural state is, so I'm much more comfortable doing that. And they also would love to know, um, if it's going to include any past members or if it's you with all new players, what's your no, it's the idea current behind band that? We've had for the last 20 years, you know, okay. it's, uh, you know, it's, I mean, the, the, the lineup we have now, like I said, that's been going for 20 plus years. I mean, it's the most stable lineup we've ever had. Yeah. Well, and I don't doubt that. I haven't seen you guys since like the 80s. So it'll be a lot of fun to see you come back and do it again. Um, I guess, you know, it's like people, they, they live in nostalgia and they hope that everything is going to be the same. And they think that all of you guys live together like the monkeys or something. And that's just well, not reality. You know, I'll tell you something that Paul told me a long time ago, and I never forgot because he's absolutely right. He goes, a lot of times people listen with their eyes and not their ears. Oh, God, yes. And, true. you know, it's, it really is true. You know, but that being said, I do it too. I understand exactly where people are coming from. But from a musical point of view, I wanted to do stuff that was more challenging. And I understand the romance of the early stuff that any band will do. You know, people yeah. identify with that. Because, you know, for most successful artists, I mean, not everyone, but the vast, vast majority... Their popularity, you know, I mean, they make their bones in the first five years they're together. You know, all that early stuff, if, if it solidifies in the audience's head, you know, who that band is and those early records are great, that's what they're going to be known as. Right. You know, so, and there are, there are a few exceptions, but for the most part, it's those first five years a band are together. But from myself, Personally, I wanted to start doing stuff that was more challenging musically. You know, I wanted to diversify, if you like, and try to just, you know, examine what limits we could go to musically. And that takes a caliber of musician that you just don't find everywhere. You know, I mean, you've got to have superior players to do that. Blackie, song-wise for this upcoming tour... Are you going to try and cover songs from the very beginning all the way through Golgotha? Oh, I mean, yeah. You've got, you've oh, got yeah. an incredible catalog and so many songs that, well, that obviously was the problem it's because when we, when we first sat down, you know, six months ago to start putting this together, we found that there was a lot of stuff that we had not done that we wanted to try, but there just wasn't room. Because in one sense, there's if we don't play, I want to be somebody. There's going to be a riot. 
Okay, I understand that. You know, so you have to do that. You have to do some of the others. And there there are staples any band is going to have to do. The Rolling Stones have never not played Satisfaction. Yeah. You know, there's just some things you got to do. You know, so you have to take that into consideration. There are always going to be fans that are going to say, well, they want to hear some ob- obscure B-sides. And I get that. And actually, we tried that once or twice, and it didn't work well. Because you're dealing with such a fragmented or singular group of people that, you know, that are really the diehards that want to hear something unusual. But that's not what the bulk of the audience is there for. Right. And you have to not, you have to be careful not to give in to that temptation. You know, so the balancing act always becomes, okay, how much do we do to satisfy the bulk of the audience? but then get into some stuff that people might go, Oh, wow. I've never heard that live before. So that becomes a challenge, you know, and I'll be honest with you. I mean, we're still working on that as we speak. Well, but considering how long it's been since you've toured the U S I would think any wasp sand is going to just be thrilled that you're playing. And well, the set you should... would hope to think that, but <laughs> you know, at the same I time, know. you know, you want to try to, you want to try to be disciplined and, and do it right. Well, right. you know, you know, if if I if I had anything to contribute to your set list, it's it's got to include something from Golgotha, because for me, when that album was released, that was like the surprise. Oh my God, this album kicks ass! Release of that year, and it, and as I still of right I, now, as of right now, there is nothing from that record in the set list. Oh, but like I said, <laughs> it could change. You've you taken into consideration, I mean, I don't know how many records we've done. It's upwards of 20. It's a lot of stuff to try yep. to visit. You know? yep. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, so one more question before we wrap up here. And, and Eddie Trunk asked you this question months ago. Have you given more thought to whether you're going to play Animal or not? Yes. Yes, you've given thought to it or yes, you're yes, going to play I've it? Yes, I've given thought to it. <laughs> That that's a I'm, pro I'm, answering the question there. <laughs> yeah. Do you do you well, remember I, the movie Bull Durham where uh, Crash Davis is trying to coach the guy on how to give his responses to the press? Yeah. Yes. He yep. tells him write it down. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I Sorry. personally don't care what you play. I'm just excited to see the tour, and I want to see the show because now I feel like I'm on Family missing. Feud. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> you are. You are. <laughs> I, seriously, there's so many bands that I see that don't understand how to entertain people anymore. So when Michael first started talking about um, working with you and doing these different things, I was excited to hear that you're going to come back and do a, a that old school type of thing. Because people you know, don't somebody asked it. me in an interview here a while back, they go, where are all the great new frontmen coming from? And I said, they ain't. They exactly. don't exist. You know, first of all, they don't have the circuit to play like we had to play coming up where you can play clubs, learn your craft. You know, you know the, the old expression, 10,000 hours of learning a trade, no matter whether you're a plumber or a carpenter or whatever it may be, it's the same with us. You know, you have to, you know, the Beatles went to Hamburg for two years to put yeah. in that 10,000 hours. You know, every band or every performer has to, to do this. And we're in a place now where that just doesn't exist anymore. So I can't really tell you if there's ever going to be anything like that again. But fortunately, we were lucky enough to be born into that little window from the mid-50s, you know, to 1990, you know, where we were exposed to that. But we still weren't that far enough removed from things like vaudeville or these carnivals that I'm talking about. We, you know, we all saw that stuff as kids growing up, you know, so you ask yourself, can I incorporate that in what we're doing musically? You know, whether it was Alice Cooper or whether before him would have been screaming Jay Hawkins and screaming Lord Such, Arthur Brown, you know, all these guys that brought real theatrical elements into what we're, we do now, you know, uh, you know, we were all exposed to those, those influences and, I don't know if an audience 
even though the material exists on YouTube to go look at, I don't know if new bands are looking that far back to see really where the roots of this stuff exist. I, I oftentimes wonder if a lot of these new musicians, especially lead singers, um, are completely forgetting about the fact that you've got to be a great lead singer, but you've got to be a ringmaster and an entertainer as well. Um, and, and I well, feel like people you focus, that, focus too much on skill and not on, you know, leading, leading the show. I was born in Tampa and we moved to New York when I was like seven and, you know, we were there for a few years and then we came back in my mid teens and my mother died in 1980. And so I was already in California at the time. And so I went back to Tampa for, for her funeral. And while I was there, it was the first time that I was dabbling in this circus idea thing. And so I had a day, you know, where there was really nothing going on. And so I, down in Sarasota, they have the Ringling Brothers Museum. Yep. And so I, you know, it's like 50 miles away. So I drove down there for the afternoon just to check it out. Well, while I was there, they had a, uh, a little tour group that was going through, you know, the different aspects of the circus and things like that. So, you know, I tagged along just to see it. And there was a magician that was doing a show and he asked for a participant to help him on stage. And normally I'm, I'm pretty shy. I don't, I don't like to do stuff like that. But I was intrigued by what this guy was doing, so I put up my hand and I went up on stage and you know I helped them for a minute. And so the tour group went on to the next thing, and I just kind of hung around and talked to him for a minute. I said, "I said, why'd you choose me?" He says, "I was feeling electricity off of you." He says, "I look for people that," and he we got into a conversation about est and different things that you do of how to work with an audience. And he says, I get people on stage sometimes that fight me. He says, I don't need that. He says, I'm looking for people that are going to help me. He says, and I could feel that coming off of you. He says, if you don't think so, he says, come with me. So he took me uh, from the room that we were in. Where it was a little theater. He opened up a side door, and there literally on the other side of that door was a guy working with, with big cats. He had you know several lions and a couple tigers. And, I mean, they were, like, touching distance away. You wouldn't have wanted to leave the door open. Let's put it that way. And he says, now, I want you to watch this guy. He says, watch what he's doing with these cats. And he had a whip and a chair, you know, the traditional stuff you see. He says, but let me ask you a question. He says, do you think for one minute that that whip or that chair is keeping those cats from jumping on him? Right. Says, yeah. No, no. really. He says, how do you think he's controlling them? And I says, I really don't know. He says, he's controlling them mentally. He says, if you're going to do what you say you want to do, when you go out on that stage, you're going to have to mentally dominate that audience. He says, and that you do that with your presence. He says, you look them in the eye and you come out there and you prowl that stage and you let them know it belongs to you. That's great. That advice. was one of the single greatest pieces of advice anyone ever gave me. And to this day, that's what I do because I look at that as like a boxing match between myself and the audience. When I come out there, that's a war. And I'm letting them know from the get go that stage belongs to me. And I'm not saying that to be arrogant. You know, any performer that can control what they're doing, they whether they could verbalize it the way I'm telling you with the guy at you know, the, the Ringling Brothers Museum or some other analogy they might use to make that point, it, it's still going to end up being the same. Yeah. That, you know, yeah. and, and when, when you hear that and then you think about all of the great bands that have existed, they've got somebody who's at that front of the stage who is a leader is a controller is a ringmaster whether it's you whether it's paul stanley whether it's bono whether it's mick jagger there's there is that strange electricity that they have that they can command not just the stage 
but the audience looking at them. Well, the way he put it to me, he says, either you're going to control them or they're going to control you. And when you're faced with that type of scenario, you think to yourself, well, I don't want to be the one that gets controlled because in, you know, if you're out there working with big cats, you're going to get eaten, you mm-hmm. know, and when you stand in front of 10, 20,000 people, the same thing can happen. So, you know, you, you would be, you would prefer to be the one who walks away intact, if you understand what I mean. Yep. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and and when I'm shooting and when I'm photographing a lot of these bands, it it even comes down to where I can almost see it, you know, in, in a close and personal sort of way, standing down in the pit. There are some that it's like they see you and they just know, okay, I'm going to pay attention and I'm going to let the photographers get some good photos because they know that I'm the press and I'm helping push this thing sure. forward. Absolutely. And there's some, yeah. And there's some performers that literally ignore you. Like they don't even know you're there and it, it, they're stumbling and you can just see that they're drowning and there's nothing you can do to help them. And I just, well, feel you know, like, and a, a seasoned performer will be able to cater to you without looking at you. Yep. You know, you're very aware that those guys are in the pit so you come out and you are performing not just for the audience, but you're performing for them as well. Because right. like you said, you are their lifeline to the public. You know, I've, I've watched this new Elvis movie four or five times already. Phenomenal. Yeah. And yeah. this kid, Austin Butler, I mean, if you don't win the Oscar, that's going to be one of the crimes of the century. Yep. But to watch what he does, you know, especially as the Elvis character gets older in his career where he's more confident in who he is, the look that's in that kid's eye when he comes out to do what he's doing, which is that look Elvis had in his eye, that means, hey, you know, I didn't get the name the king for no reason. You know, and that's not an arrogance. It's like what I was talking about with Paul earlier. Yeah. It's a self-confidence of knowing that you belong there. Yeah. And it takes a while to develop that. Well, and you have to have it to be able to stand up in front of all those people and play. And, you know, the funny part about it is that most of us that do this are introverted. Which yeah. is bizarre to me. Yeah. I know. And I can't, don't ask me. I mean, you'd need to talk to a therapist to explain that. Yeah. You know, when, when you were sharing your story at, at the Ringling Museum and you're like, well, you know, I don't normally raise my hand and do that. I'm like yeah, you're the guy that's on stage drinking blood out of a, yeah, out, right. out of you a know, skull and throwing yeah. meat into the audience. Yeah, you're, you're shocked. Am, <laughs> if I could answer it, I, I'd write a book and make a lot of money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Blackie, this was, uh, this was an honor. Thank you so much yeah, for giving us you. some of your time today to talk about all of this. Um, well, thanks, everybody. Looking, I, looking, I appreciate you all taking the time. 